Welcome to the Fire Decision Making Refresher for Agency Administrators webinar. My name is Tanya Opperman and I work for the Wildland Fire Management Research, Development and Applications Program as a Fire Analyst. On today's webinar, we have several people from the Wildland Fire Management RDNA, including myself, Tammy Parkinson, Morgan Pence, and Dan Mindar, who are also Fire Analysts, and Tim Sexton, the Program Manager. We also have some guest speakers. Tom Montoya, Forest Supervisor on the Wallowa Whitman National Forest, and Dale Dieter, Forest Supervisor on the Prescott National Forest. We've organized the webinar into five parts. After the opening remarks from Tom, Tammy's going to cover new direction and guidance. Tim will update us on RMAT, and that's going to be followed by WIFTUS review from Morgan, and then Dale will address right of refusal. And we'll end with the Q&A session and close the webinar at the top of the hour. So let's get started with some opening remarks from Tom Montoya, who will introduce himself. Go ahead, Tom. Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's Agency Administrator webinar. Let me start by introducing myself and sharing a little bit about the work I've been doing related to Agency Administrator certification. My name is Tom Montoya, and I am a Forest Supervisor on the Wallow Whitman National Forest in Region 6. I'm also a member of the Forest Service National Fire Line Officer Team, also known as the NLOT. Um, NLOT is also a part of the National Fire Leadership Council, which the Leadership Council is made up of Forest Service um, fire directors, both at the regional level and the national level, as well as um, NLOT members uh, in composing that uh, Leadership Council. As part of the National Line Officer Team, um, I took on an effort the past couple years to lead uh, a group of directors and line officers in revising the agency administrator certification process for both uh, wildfire and prescribed fire. This uh, change or revision in the certification process only applies to the Forest Service and not other agencies. I believe it's important to recognize that it's our job as agency administrators and line officers to give clear leaders intent and objectives in incoming to incoming fire resources and to clearly remain engaged throughout the life of an incident. When we don't give clear objectives or remain engaged, we give control to the incoming resources or incident management team who may not fully understand our local needs, those political pressures, and the sensitive issues that we are dealing with. When we aren't engaged, we can end up with results we really don't want, including resource damage, frayed relationships in our communities, financial issues, costly rehab, and unsightly suppression efforts. Engaging in pre-season planning meetings with our fire personnel, our agency partners, those stakeholders we work with every day, as well as the cooperators is very important. Encourage partners to participate in the local fire refreshers and the simulation exercises that occur across units um, before those events happen on the landscape. Including these partners when there is a fire on the landscape that may affect agency boundaries, jurisdiction, counties, state lines, and associated values as they spread across the landscape. This next slide that we'll show you demonstrates um, why that's important, which is the premise behind the National Cohesive Wildfire Strategy. Inviting those partners to participate in planning efforts associated with a fire event on the landscape, as in the example, the complexity of those events with multiple partners, as shown in the slide, is really important. As you can see, the red line is the fire perimeter and the peak line is the planning area that we have outlined. The fire is impacting both the states of California and Oregon, jurisdictions of the BLM, Forest Service, and private ownership. Having these engagements with partners early on um, in the season will help us with coordination of decisions and implementation of fire as it occurs on the landscape. The use of analytics, although we do not, they do not always provide the answer, they do help us in informing those decisions and help us in planning ahead. 
we must communicate to is management teams that we want to see utilization of these tools. As these tools help to address impacts on values at risk from the predicted fire spread and the behavior. There is a lot of tools available to us. Um, we do not need to be experts in these tools or how those analytics works, but we need to know how to ask the questions to guide those analytics to get us to a better informed decision. The slide that you see there is an example of one of those analytic tools that can help track the documentation of strategy from WOFDAS and 209s throughout the duration of an incident. There are other analytics in the slide, uh, but this is just one example of how that can be used. I want to emphasize that reducing firefighter and public exposure is our highest priority. Evaluating incidents to assess the values at risk and if the exposure to the resources is commensurate with the values that we are protecting. This evaluation process should be throughout the duration of the incident, not just during initial attack or when there is active fire behavior, but all through that event. We still have risks to incidents during mop-up and during bear activities as that fire comes to a close. The personnel within the Wildland Fire Management Research Development Application Group are always there to help us. They're there to help um, with questions we have around risk assessment, objectives, fire analytics, or with this navigation. I encourage you to reach out to them whenever you need them and use those resources and handouts that are presented to you in this re webinar today and on the website. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that, Tom. It sets the stage for today's refresher and it reminds everyone that help is always available. Next we have Tammy Parkinson from the RDNA and she's going to talk about what's new in direction and guidance. Go ahead, Tammy. Great. Thanks, Tanya. So I just want to give a quick review over the chapters that are relative to line officers and some emphasis items to review. Chapter 1 applies to all agencies. Fire management plans and spatial plans and activities are to incorporate firefighter exposure, public health, compliance with clean air and environmental quality. And there is an addition here, the addition of firefighter exposure. Another common thread of the updates within Chapter 1 includes more references to air quality and standards associated with particulate materials. Please review the following chapters for specific agency guidance and changes that may affect agency administrators and their oversight of the programs. Chapter 2 is the BLM. Chapter 3 is National Park Service. Chapter 4, Fish and Wildlife Service. Chapter 5, for the Forest Service, there's been quite a few updates within the Forest Service as far as risk management updates and training. There's been several changes to required training and oversight responsibilities of fire management and development and pilot tests of the agency administrator taskbook and prescribed fire and wildfire. It's a combination of prescribed fire and wildfire. Chapter 6 is the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Within the continuation of the direction of guidance, also consider reviewing the Appendix A. This is to consider a review for sample questions around fire site visits. Appendix C and D are some templates of sample delegations and the team in briefing outlines. Appendix G is another leader's intent and delegation letter that may be used for incident management team. And Appendix N is with the specific information. So, the area that's circled in red highlights all of the changes made in the 2019 Red Book in case you are interested or it might help differentiate the changes made for implementation this field season. Although it's not a change in policy or guidance, we thought the site would be a good reference to share in case it's needed. It's also included in your handout that are uploaded on the webinar document site that Tanya included. Some additional information we thought would be useful is the website for the Critical Incident Response Toolbox. There's a lot of useful information on this site in the event it's needed. Some of the areas of emphasis is included is critical incident management response, strategic response to a crisis, peer support, our standard care, 
a manager's toolbox providing leadership in crisis, and suicide prevention and intervention and postvention, and other resources. We encourage you to take a look or include this website as something to reference. All right. Thanks, Tammy. That is a lot of helpful information. And just a reminder, if you have any questions about that, you can certainly type them into that questions panel. And remember to download those handouts. So next, we'll get a quick update on the risk management assistance teams. They operate in the Forest Service. And we can share this information with those of you in DOI or state agencies as well who have may maybe worked with our MATS in the past and wonder what they're all about. Tim is the program manager for the Wildland Fire Management RDNA. And he's been involved in these teams over the past two years. Tim, go ahead. Hello. Uh, I'd like to talk just a little bit about risk management assistance teams uh, that were started a couple of years ago in 2017. These teams have provided seasoned line officer, advanced operations, and analytical support to provide local agency administrators with enhanced decision space for managing large, long-duration wildfires. In 2017, we assisted on 11 incidents on-site, 2018 on-site 16 times, and provided virtual assistance to an additional 19 incidents. Uh, with 2019, we are transitioning to risk management assistance, RMA, uh, no T or no teams. We are de-emphasizing the on-site uh, support and trying to emphasize uh, virtual support because we believe we can uh, reach more uh, agency administrators and wildfires that way. With that said, there may be a few assignments in which line officers really want a full team on site, and we will respond with an on site team. Again, that will be the exception. So upon request, uh, line officers, and there are RMAT trained line officers available for assignments, they'll be starred on the national line officer list and status in Ross. Units needing or wanting an RMA line officer will name request them through the region. They will support the agency administrator in person and serve as a liaison for the products. Analytics, Rick Stratton, uh, works for the national office, will again coordinate the RMA analytics. We may support a few incidents on site again, but the bulk of the assistance will be virtual. Uh, the risk element that uh, we, we have done in the past where we uh, assess the risk to the public, risk to firefighters, risk to uh, improvements in uh, natural resources, Shane Greer will lead this effort primarily using a trade-off analysis template. Uh, that's been modified a number of times over the last couple of years, and he's currently in the process of refining this tool. Uh, one of the things that we are moving toward is em emphasizing pre-event planning rather than try to do all these things at the time of the uh, incident. So in that pre-event planning emphasis, the, there are a number of products. I'm not going to go through them at this time. There's a handout that you can access that shows some of these. But the uh, uh, PCL, SDI, and PODs, Kit O'Connor, one of our Rocky Mountain Research Station scientists, is the lead for that and can uh, provide those upon request. Uh, generalized risk assessments and PODs, uh, Rick Stratton uh, can provide those. And then for generalized WHPTS assistance, you can contact me for, for that. Um, and any one of the three can lead you in the right direction if you've um, contact if you're unsure about which person to contact for specific analytics. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, thanks for referencing that handout that does have a lot of information about the strategic planning that happens prior to ignition. There's also an RMAT website, and that is listed on the handout that has all the helpful links. So moving on to part three next, we have Morgan Pence from the RDNA who will cover some WIFTIS topics that are of special interest to agency administrators. Go ahead, Morgan. Thanks, Tanya, and hello, everyone. I have a few WIFTIS preseason refresher topics to cover to set you up for success if your unit has large fires this season, and a few new features in WIFTIS that were added that are pertinent to your role. So first, the preseason preparation items include setting up your WFTIS account and ensuring you have access, identifying your primary WFTIS support roles, familiarizing yourself with your unit's uploaded data, 
and participating in local unit refreshers. I'll then share a few new features that were added in the last year, including uh, planning area notifications, incident group enhancements, and the removal of with this light. I'll go deeper into each of these in the following slides. Okay, so first off, um, plan to get your WFDIS account ready. WFDIS, if you don't know and are new, is the online decision support system that you will use to inform, develop, and document your incident decision making. Displayed here is the login page for WFDIS production. There is also a training site with all the same features, but it has an orange heading instead of a blue heading to help you differentiate between the two systems. If you're a new line officer and don't already have an account, set one up today. Navigate to the login page and click the Request New Account button that's circled on the screen. If you already have an account, make sure your password is current. Passwords in Liftus must be changed every 60 days. If you fail to keep your password up to date, your account becomes locked and then you have to contact the IIA help desk to get a password reset. If you have not logged into your account in over two years, your account then becomes disabled, and then you have to contact your geographic area editor to get your user roles reassigned before the help desk can get your password reset. So it's very important to keep your account current. And please pay attention closely to what I'm about to say next. We do anticipate some IT changes later in the, in the season regarding how long an account can be accessed without a login. When we understand the impacts and the timing of those changes, we will communicate them with our WFDIS users. So as always, watch for the email reminders that WFDIS sends regarding the currency of your password, and know that we do anticipate that there will be changes coming later this season regarding how long an account can remain active without someone logging in. If you don't know what your password is, log in today and find out and make sure it's current. Okay, once you've got your access squared away, make sure that your WFDIS account contact information is current. To check, navigate to the My Home tab and then click Contact Information. Your contact information should include phone numbers where you can be reached, especially during fire season. If you ever need to submit a WFDIS issue via feedback, the WFDIS support staff will use the phone numbers in the contact information to, to contact you. And if we can't reach you, we can't help you get your issue resolved or answer your questions. There's also an option on this screen to select your cell phone carrier and generate an alternative address for alerts. If you do this, your cell phone will receive text message alerts about your decision statuses and it's, um, if they, when they're ready for review or not. It's a helpful feature and it can be turned on and off easily. On this page, you must also keep your email address up to date. Um, your geographic, or you can also set it, your geographic area, the agency, and the unit. You only need one WFDIS account for your career. It's designed to follow you as you change jobs or move between agencies. Avoid creating duplicate accounts and instead just keep your one account but keep it current and up to date. You can't stress enough how important it is to keep your email current on the contact page. Alerts for password changes and decision approvals go to that email. If your email has changed, you need to get it updated in WFDIS. And I'm specifically talking now to the Forest Service listeners because the agency-wide emails are changing to the USDA.gov domain, you must change your email in WFDIS. It will not happen automatically. If you don't update your email address, once the fsfed.us stops forwarding your emails, you will no longer get the automatic emails from WFDIS about password changes, for example, and that will put your account in jeopardy of being locked. And you won't receive notices about decision review and approval. If you know your new Forest Service email, you can go ahead and change it now. Next, identify the individuals who will serve as your primary WFDIS support roles. The two we'll focus on are your unit's WFDIS data manager 
and your agency's geographic area editor. Your unit Swiftus data manager has special privileges to preload the fire management direction from your unit's land and resource management plan to Swiftus in the form of strategic objectives and management requirements. They can also load other unit shapes useful to fire management. Geographic area editors are regional resources who assign user roles to the individuals within their agency and geographic area. They also essentially own the incidents within their geographic area. The geographic area editor, um, there's typically um, one to two assigned for each of the federal agencies for each geographic area. And these individuals have technical and policy expertise if you need assistance. They also manage the fire behavior requests and can help you get the analytical support you need. So this is where the WIFDIS address book comes in handy because it can help you determine who these people are in your unit if you don't know. You can use the address book filters for this. Log in to your WIFDIS account, navigate to the My Home tab, and select address book and then use the address book filters to narrow down the roles, the geographic area, and the agency. In this example on the screen, I've filtered for data managers in the Southwest for the Forest Service. So then it provides a list on the screen of everybody who meets that definition. And then you can use the unit designator to determine which unit each person is from and find those in your area and neighboring units. Now that you've identified your unit Swiftus data manager, you can contact that individual and request a Swiftus walkthrough to acquaint yourself with what's been uploaded for your unit. You will now, you will, you will understand how your unit plan management direction is spatially represented in Swiftus and learn if any unit specific data has been loaded that might be useful during an incident. In this example on the screen, Mexican spotted owl and goshawk habitat are represented spatially as unit shapes that the data manager has loaded. And they display as pink polygons, both inside and outside of the red fire perimeter and within the planning area, shown in purple. Understanding where these values are in relation to the fire is critical when you're scrambling to figure out your course of action and publish your decision. And you'll be able to quickly reference the proximity to most urgent values on your landscape. If highly valued resources and asset data are missing in your uploaded data, work with your WIFDIS data manager to get the missing data uploaded. Other unit shapes are a great, great way to quickly upload and display values data and have them show up in a planning area values inventory. And finally, as part of your preseason work, practice, practice, practice. The WIFDIS training site is exactly like production, but it's made for users to practice. Data managers can ensure that all the same data that is on production is also in training for users. Many units host pre-season WIFDIS refreshers. You can attend those in your area and practice with your team. If it's been a while since your unit has held a WIFDIS refresher, encourage your unit to hold one. Now I'm going to transition to talking about a couple new WIFDIS features. In 2018, we made a couple enhancements that are of particular interest to those serving in your role. These include adding a planning area notification and improvements to the incident group functionality. Additionally, we will be dis dis decommissioning with this light later in the spring. And as a reminder, we post release notes on Wif the WIFDIS homepage that cover all the enhancements in the past years. Okay, so now let's talk about the planning area notifications that was added late this fall. When a fire has a pending decision and a planning area is drawn that includes a portion of a unit you've subscribed to, your current unit for example, you will receive an email notification. Planning area subscriptions are optional. You do not have to sign up for them. The intent though is to help facilitate communication between neighboring units and to promote cooperation early in the life of an incident and the decision-making process. To subscribe to planning areas being drawn on your unit or units, go to the system preferences, which is under My Home, 
and then from the subscribe to planning area notification section you can select your geographic area from the left hand side you will then select your agency and then your unit and then select the unit you want and click the subscribe button in the example on the screen on the right hand side you can see that I have selected to receive notifications for planning areas drawn on the Rogue River Siskiyou and the Sayuslaw National Forest, as well as the Medford BLM District in the Northwest and Yosemite National Park in Southern California. A record of the email notifications is recorded in the incident history. If you need to find out who received the notifications, you can navigate to the incident history and see when the email notifications were mailed and to whom. If you cannot view the draft planning area for an incident and it's impacting your unit that you have responsibilities for, you will then need to coordinate with that incident to be added as an owner or an editor or a reviewer in order to see that incident's information. Okay, now let's talk about incident groups. The incident group functionality has been in WFIS for a few years now, but we did make some improvements last summer that may be of use to those managing and tracking multiple incidents at once. For background, an incident group is a customized collection of incidents that users assigned the author role can create to quickly manage and review details about incidents of interest. Incident groups are also automatically created for incidents that have been complex in computer-aided dispatch systems and the 209 reporting system. New features that we added in the last year include the ability to share the incident group with more than one individual, the ability to download decisions from the incident group page, and create a group by drawing a polygon around incidents from the intelligence map. On the screen is a user-created incident group from last summer. From this one location, you can track the status of decisions and approvers for all the incidents in the group, as well as download the most current decision for some or all incidents in one single download. You can also navigate directly between the incidents from this page using the links. For more information on incident groups and how they can help you track and manage more than one incident, you can use the WFDIS help and search on incident groups. And finally, um, we, are, we are going to be decommissioning WFDIS Lite later this spring. WFDIS Lite, if you didn't know, is a lighter weight version of WFDIS that has less functionality than the full-blown WFDIS. It was designed for mobile phones, and as I said, we'll be de decommissioning it later this spring. The full WFDIS application can be accessed on a mobile device using the Chrome app or browser, and it also works well on Safari. The functionality of WFDIS Lite can all be completed on the full version of WFDIS from a mobile device. So if you were used to using WFDIS Lite in the past, we're sorry, but please start using the full regular version of WFDIS on your mobile phone. Uh, this wraps up our section on WFDIS review. It's Tanya, turning it back over to you. Great, thanks for that, Morgan. There is a lot to digest there, so just a reminder to see those handouts. There's some links and checklists in there to do for preseason WFDIS readiness. Next, we'd like to welcome our guest speaker, Dale Dieter. Dale has been the forest supervisor on the Prescott National Forest since January of 2018. He came from the Bridger Teton National Forest in Jackson, Wyoming, where he was the district ranger for almost 11 years. For fire management, he draws on experience gained as a firefighter, forester, hydrologist, and line officer in his work on the Gila, Idaho Panhandle, Fish Lake, Bridger Teton, and Prescott National Forests. Dale is going to address the concept of right of refusal. Go ahead, Dale. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. So the risk refusal process, is, as hopefully most of you know, is located in the IRPG. And it starts on page 19. It's in the gray section uh, where, where they talk about specific hazards. And hopefully everyone's got that on their person when they're on an incident. 
<clears throat> so the things that I wanted to relay today about the risk refusal process, first of all, is that there is a process. And um, I, as I said, most people are probably aware that that's the case. However, um, it, I think it's really easy to think that because it's in the IRPG that it's just an ops thing. And I point I want to make today is that it applies equally to agency administrators. As an AA, you may find yourself in a situation where either a team or individuals um, that are working for you may refuse an assignment. And you need to be able to recognize that it might not come to you as formally as it does when it's a tactical refusal. Um, it, it could be a little bit more subtle, but uh, the same rules are still going to apply. The thing to know if, if, if you do start this process is there are expectations uh, for actions on your part um, with regards to conversations as well as potentially documentation. And the most important uh, piece of this whole risk refusal process is the conversation. On, on any given incident, um, there's going to be varying levels of understanding for the situational awareness. Not everybody might be working from the same comp common, common operating picture. They might not have common understanding of the incident or tactical objectives. The conversation helps facilitate that and put everyone on the same level playing field. So I want to uh, speak briefly to the importance of the risk refusal process. And in my mind, it ties, first of all, directly to our foundational doctrine. And this applies to all agencies. It ties directly to the values that we place on life safety, first of all. And then second of all, when, when we send people on assignments, we can't possibly imagine every situation that they're going to find themselves in. And doctrine... Tight, uh, places high value then on the training experience that we put in these folks and that they bring to the incident um, to look at the situation they find themselves in and make the right decision. Because uh, no, there's no set of rules we can create, not even a 10 and 18 that's going to protect people all the time. And so we need that ability to have uh, the trust in, in their decisions for, for, for the situations they find themselves in. And it, it also relates uh, fundamentally to the safety culture that we want. We want um, troops that are willing to speak truth to power, point out hard truths, and uh, those kinds of things. So uh, there's, there's, this process has value for all those uh, elements of our fire system. It's not uncommon that people with decision-making authority or, or perhaps the most experienced person on fire, say an IC, might not have a complete picture of the operational environment. And so, again, can't overemphasize enough the value of the conversation, um, talking through um, the different options, um, the different qualities of exposure, not just how long people are going to show up, but the different qualities of exposure that people might be exposed to under the given options, and, and just really making sure that everyone's um, speaking about the same situation in the same way, using the same definitions. Lastly, I would just say that risk management is not about finding a safe way to do stupid things. and And so, People on the ground are, are in some way telling you that um, the, the values don't seem commensurate with the risks, that the probability of success might not be not what you think. There needs to be a conversation, and we need to be listening. So um, this is out of the Forest Service chapter in the Red Book, um, but I just wanted you to see the verbiage because when you transfer to the first paragraph in the IRPG, you'll notice similar wording. And note that, that um, it's an expectation that hopefully every agency administrator has, but it's certainly of the agencies that that we're empowering people to um, do what they need to do to uh, carry out leaders' intent and also provide for their own safety. So just, I'll just walk you through the um, the risk refusal process. It, it's a, it's two pages. You're looking at the whole thing right there. Notice in bold that um, a first part of the process is for the individual or the team to come with you, uh, to you with alternatives for um, trying to meet uh, the assigned intent, leader's intent. And, and there again, so that it's going to take conversation to facilitate uh, that understanding. If, if you can't come to a common agreement about uh, the alternatives, then you are in the situation, as is shown in the third paragraph, that you have a turn down. And uh, once you hit that point, then that's when uh, it triggers some immediate actions on your part. First of all, the super, the safety officer for the incident should be notified um, that there's been a turn down. And you need to, if, if you're on the incident that does not have a safety officer, then you would find an IC or the appropriate section chief uh, that's available. But um, that would be a conversation that would need to happen immediately. You decide that maybe it was just a given crew maybe didn't have the experience or uh, that they needed to carry it out, but perhaps another resource would be uh, would be okay implementing an assignment. 
you need to inform them that this that the previous uh, crew or, or team or, or whatever uh, resource you're dealing with refused the assignment and why. There needs to be a discussion around that so that, that that's all uh, plain and clear to everybody. If there have been safety violations, um, then then there's also some additional documentation that, that should follow with SafeNet or SafeCom. The last paragraph in the manual shows that this isn't the intent of this process is not to keep actions from happening, but it, it is to facilitate and foster a conversation. And that, so, what I would leave leave you with last is just the importance of uh, an agency administrator's awareness of of the risk refusal process for two reasons. One is that we we need to kind of be just monitoring that the the teams we're working with are respecting that tactically with the resources on the ground. But then we also need to understand the process because we may very well have um, a team uh, come to us or, or individuals come to us that, that also uh, offer us a refusal risk and we need to be uh, open to that and understanding of what what's expected of us to proceed further. So that's all I've got. Thank you. Great. Thanks for going over that with us, Dale. I think a lot of us are familiar with that concept, but maybe not in the way you talked about it as it applies to agency administrators. So I think that's really good information for everyone. We are going to transition into the Q&A session for about 15 minutes, and then we'll do a brief closeout at the end with some additional information. And we've got Morgan, Tammy, Tim, Tom, and Dale on the line. And Dan is going to facilitate the Q&A. So, Dan, do we have any questions in the panel that you want to read out? Yeah. Um, I think we'll start with some for, for Dale since uh, he just finished and that's fresh on our minds. Uh, first one is from Kay Wind. Uh, her question is, perhaps I missed it. Can you clarify what is risk refusal? Okay. So uh, risk, risk, where it's where it's real clear is where, say, uh, you've asked a hotshot crew to go into a division uh, to put in some line that they're not comfortable with, and uh, you might have a crew boss come to you and uh, indicate, or come to, in this case, division, say, and and indicate that um, they don't feel comfortable doing it uh, with 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 attack. The, the tactics that are being prescribed, but that here's some alternate ways that they would consider uh, maybe making that a safe uh, approach to uh, still meet the intent of of uh, controlling that piece of line. Order. So there's this kind of a tactical side of that, but um, but to an agency administrator, it could look like um, a team uh, being on a totally different page around the strategy. It could even be strategic. It doesn't even have, in my mind doesn't even have to be tactical. There could be some strategic differences about how you're approaching the fire. It could be about how maybe you're managing local resources that they're not comfortable with with the integration with the team or, or how safety is being uh, applied in that regard. There, there could be a, a whole host of reasons. And like I said, it wouldn't necessarily always come to you um, uh, directly from, say, an IC saying that uh, I'm refusing uh, this assignment and with, with his IRPG in hand, but but if, if your team's saying, I can't work with you, I think you need to look at that. And, and Or if they're saying, find another team, I think you need to look at that as a risk re refusal, still go through the same process and have the same discussions. And those kind of things do happen. Uh, there's another question here from uh, Rita Lanford, um, and I think this applies to you, Dale. The question is, is who is to enter in SafeNet or SafeCom? So I assume what she's asking is whose responsibility is that then to enter um, a, a, a risk refusal into a SafeNet or SafeCom? If if you if any any of the parties that were part of uh, an unsafe act, um, you know, firsthand witnesses would be a preference. I think as an agency administrator, you could also enter it as well. But it would the main thing I think would be to be just closing loop and tracking that that. Uh, that that kind of documentation does get done. I'm not sure it completely matters who does it as long as everyone knows who that uh, delegated person would be. Alyssa Tanner writes, uh, does this relate to the risk assessment matrix being done by the incident team? If so, how? So I, I think it does relate. And to, 
it, it, it's pretty much the language that, that are, say, that are in those matrix, those should be the kinds of elements that um, someone who's refusing risk brings to you saying, um, for the, it's these reasons couched in the 10 and 18 or what you find in the risk matrix that, that we are concerned with and that we don't feel like that we can properly mitigate and that are bringing um, uh, our concern to the forefront. So I, th I think it's kind of what helps formulate, it helps frame and, and formulate uh, the conversation. Here's one uh, probably for Morgan, and, and I think you probably covered it, but uh, let's, let's go over this. Um, she wanted to remind all agency administrators if they've moved to new positions to update their profile um, to their change location. So maybe, Morgan, you can emphasize the fact that, uh, you know, sometimes you might move to a new position and your email, perhaps even your phone number, hasn't changed. Yes. So the, back to the, the contact information page in WFDIS. That's where you will put your phone numbers and your emails, those chains, which often do when you're when you're moving to a new position. But there's also in there it your associated geographic area, agency and unit. So even if you're not changing agencies, your unit might be changing. So you can adjust what unit you're in from the contact information page. And you should do that when you um, move agencies or jobs to make sure that everything is current and that uh, you get all of the notifications that you mean to get. Here's a new question, uh, and anyone can answer this. Uh, the question is, is are the two nine, 2019 Red Books out? Yes. They're posted on the next I know site. they're out electronically. Are they out in, in, in hard copy printed version? They should be. It'd be a matter of ordering ordering them, Dan, from their local okay. unit, ordering them from the PMS number. Kathleen okay. Miner asks, will Region 6 be staffing the AA desk this season? So that, that question has been answered. Yes, Region 6 will be running the AA desk this season. Just found a new one here. Uh, I guess this would be addressed to Tim. Is there a more complete description available for our map and the handout that includes the 2019 plan that was described? Uh, not at this time. We're working on a uh, communications plan or updated communications plan. It'll be posted to the RMAP website, and you can find a link to that uh, on the RDNA website. Uh, so we're continuing uh, some discussions on uh, specific, more specifics to what uh, risk management assistance will look like in 2019 and beyond. Again, uh, look for that on uh, a link to that on the uh, RDNA website. And I believe that's it for questions. All right, great. Thanks for handling that facilitation, Dan. We appreciate that. If you do find you have more questions later, you can certainly reach us in a number of ways. We do have uh, the WIFTIS feedback button, and when you click that feedback button, it's available on almost every page of the application. It does email and text those people that are on call, and we respond pretty quickly to feedbacks. Remember what Morgan said, if your email isn't up to date, then the feedback is not going to get back to you. The answer is not going to get back to you, so make sure your contact information is up to date. Next, uh, the WIFTIS homepage has a phone number. It's highlighted there in yellow. It's the decision content support number. It's a different number than the one you called to get your password reset. It's a phone number that is shared among the RDNA staff, and we staff that phone every day of the year for several hours a day. In, in the summer, we're on, on this answering this phone uh, probably 16 or 18 hours a day. So please... Use that number if you have questions about decision content or WIFTIS navigation or things of that nature. And finally, we have the RDNA website, which is separate from WIFTIS. The RDNA website does have a tech transfer section and a decision support section. The decision support section has a agency administrator toolbox area and you can use that to find a lot of the handouts referenced today, recordings of this webinar, and, and things like that. 
And with that, we'd like to thank you and thank all of our speakers today. Have a safe fire season, and thanks for watching.